I have a hard enough time getting up in front of a crowd of pure mathematicians. <laughs> so in this kind of a diverse audience, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'll do my best. So Yuri Manin uh, received his doctorate from Moscow State University in 1961. By the way, all the dates I'm going to mention are at the level of Wikipedia, so don't take them too seriously. <laughs> and he was a professor there from 1965 to 92. Now, the young people here are probably not aware of the amazing fertility of mathematics in the USSR during this period, the rich array of fantastic and singularly original ideas that emanated out of Moscow, Leningrad, Novosibirsk, many places like that, inspiring the rest of the world with all respect and even fear, I think. Okay. Since I was something like a mathematical apprentice around the time I first encountered this community in the early 1990s, I've never been able to get over that experience. So even now, I feel a vague sense of inadequacy whenever I meet people, uh, mathematicians from the Soviet era, even if they're very friendly colleagues like Boris Zilber here. <laughs> right. uh, but since 1993, uh, oh, sorry, uh, but, the, but the main thing I forgot to say, uh, sorry, but, uh, but recently, so in preparing this, this talk, uh, this introduction, I went through the long list of, of Professor Manin's students that he taught those years in Moscow, and I realized that, in fact, he's been largely responsible for my fear. <laughs> Many of these people include field medalists and people greater than field medalists, and you, know, you can imagine what it was like for me to encounter these people as a young student. Since 1993, Yuri Manin has been a director of the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics in Bonn and a professor at Northwestern University. Among his numerous academic honors, I'll mention just the Lenin Prize, uh, the Brouwer Medal from the Dutch Academy of Science, the Rolf Schock Prize from the Royal Swedish Academy, the King Faisal Prize from the King Faisal Foundation, and the Georg Kantor Medal from the German Mathematical Society. I'm just mentioning these, of course, there's a longer list, but just to give you a sense of the international impact of these ideas. Now, Professor Manin's influence in number theory has been both far-ranging and profound. So I'll just mention one example that gives, I believe, a good sense of the presence that he's had in the community. As an undergraduate in Moscow, Yuri Manin wrote one of the most influential papers in geometry and number theory of the 20th century, I think, on algebraic curves over fields with differentiation. There was at this time already a strong sense among number theorists that there's something very similar about rational numbers and rational functions. But Professor Manin's paper was one of the first that really pursued this analogy to provide very deep theorems in the subject that have been influential ever since. The main difference, of course, is that rational functions compared to rational numbers you can differentiate. And the ideas that were explained in this paper, uh, it's fa fair to say they've been haunting number theorists ever since, trying to figure out some way to do the kind of things that he did with functions with numbers in ways that were very concrete. For example, the theory of the Gauss-Manin connection have been, has been very influential. But also, it's, it's been at the level of inspiring mysterious and visionary programs. For example, the recent attempt to, to prove the ABC conjecture belongs to this range of influence. In addition to number theory, Professor Manin has been enormously influential in mathematical physics, uh, being the originator of many fertile research programs in string theory and quantum field theory. He has furthermore always emphasized the unity of vision that drives his research into both subjects. Um, uh, so he'll be giving the mathematics colloquium tomorrow, actually, at the Andrew Wiles building to which all of you are invited, of course. And there we'll see uh, the genuine and active interplay of number theory and physics and geometry that's been so characteristic of his research. In any case, the remarkable, remarkably subtle balance between du duality and unity of arithmetic and physics is what motivated us, mostly Alex and me, that is, to invite him to deliver these open lectures today. All right. Finally, I'm going to use a term that Professor Manin himself might not like and mention that he's a great philosopher of mathematics, quite possibly the best expositor of mathematical theory and practice among living mathematicians. As you know, when a practitioner writes about his own subject, it's well nigh impossible to find an appropriate middle ground between 
obscurity, and vacuity. Professor Manin is among the few mathematicians I know who is able to do this with consistency and apparent ease. In reading the essays collected in his book, Mathematics as Metaphor, it's hard not to be immediately impressed by the graceful prose that still manages to imbue every single sentence with deep meaning. So it might have been good to close this introduction with a substantial quote, but I'm sure you'd rather hear Professor Manin speak than to hear me quoting him. So I've asked instead that the link to a very illuminating interview be attached to the announcement for this open lecture. I hope Alex yeah, made that possible. Okay, so you can read that for yourself. Um, but you see, it, uh, the title of the interview is already very interesting is it because you see, I'll tell you that a segment of the interview is about proof in mathematics. A, a, a topic, of course, that's of great importance to most mathematicians. And about this, the title of the interview quotes Professor Manin telling us that good proofs are the proofs that make us wiser. And I hope the students here, both mathematicians and physicists, will take this really to heart. Okay. Please welcome Professor Manin. Thank you very much. Of course, it is a honor and a pleasure to uh, be here to deliver an outcome lecture here. And uh, in particular, you will see that um, Occam's razor uh, has some metaphorical connection with uh, the subject about I, I will be speaking about. Uh, uh, one problem is that I have restricted time and I don't have a clock. So <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. But please do not forget to tell me. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I would like to start um, this presentation. Uh, I'll skip the plan because I will reshuffle this story. Um, uh, with part one, which I would like to call modern metaphysics. The point is that uh, whenever the first physical laws were discovered, stated, the famous Newton uh, F equals to MA, we will not say it in this form, but anyway, we got accustomed to it, um, a lot of uh, things necessary for understanding what does this law mean were left in the shed. F equals to MA. Uh, to what it does refer? What is a force? What is a um, acceleration? Uh, what is mass? And things like that. Uh, there are several things. One is how do you measure the things? Another is in what condition you should put your measurements in order that your formula had some sense, and so on. What I uh, call uh, beginning of the modern metaphysics started somewhat later, and uh, then what was implicit before became explicit. You should imagine an isolated system. An isolated system can be a massive point moving in a force field. So in particular, this force field at this point, and things like that. Uh, or it can be on the uh, other uh, side of the spectrum, the whole universe. It can be considered as isolated system. Otherwise, uh, Einstein could not have produced his uh, theory of general relativity. Uh, so you should imagine at the beginning some kind of idealized description of uh, isolated system. Uh, with configuration space and phase space. Configuration space does not take into account time. Phase uh, space takes into account time because we now know the answer to the classical uh, paradox. How can it happen that a point sits uh, whatever physical sits at the point of 
space and still moves in time. How it is going back? The, the point is that the answer is that the point sits not in the space but in a phase space. It has not only position but also vector of movement. Uh, and uh, much later there was a great idea that uh, on this uh, say, phase space there exists a function of two <coughs> functions, energy if time is fixed, uh, action if time can change, and uh, so uh, uh, this energy and function, this uh, energy and action, this function uh, can be taken as an input to some very general expressions. In the first expression, this is integral over the whole imaginary space of exponential of minus energy divided by the temperature. And the second, uh, it is a mysterious but, but deliciously fascinating Feynman's integral where uh, you take uh, action and multiply it by imaginary time and then you create. Uh, well, in simplest cases, you can replace these integrals by sums, finite or infinite. Uh, what well, I was uh, absolutely mystified from my young years, how does it be, can it be that inverse temperature corresponds to imaginary time? And then uh, I found out that in the modern cosmology, in fact, the inverse temperature of uh, background cosmic radiation is time, cosmological time, which is very much unlike those times that figure in Einstein theory. But I will say a few words about it tomorrow in another lecture. And then the two metaphysics belong, belong uh, some additional constraints that are input in the physical theory and constrain it. For example, there can be symmetries. Everything can be symmetry, symm uh, uh, symmetrical with respect, for example, to a uh, group of linear translations, linear transformations of Minkowski space and things like that. So all of these laws that govern laws, physical laws, I call it metaphysics. OK. This I will temporarily. And now I want <coughs> to explain you a little bit about what kind of reality in inverted commas I will be speaking today. Reality in the world of ideas. Well, uh, the, <coughs> the first reality is something like uh, the set of non-negative or even positive integers. One, two, three, four, five, things like that. Uh, it's, of course, a purely uh, ideal construction, but we got so accustomed to it uh, and to its various relationship to physical world, you can count things. Things are different, or you think they are different. You can count multiple things. But what do we say when we say that our space is three-dimensional? Just imagine, what are we counting? Anyway, uh, uh, I will uh, now illustrate, now this is about reality, physical reality in the world of ideas, but without laws. Now I will consider a very concrete, very experimental uh, law, which is called Ziff's law. Uh, he was considering a, a kind of uh, linguistic uh, databases before such things existed. Of course, there was a lot of dictionaries always. Consider a certain corpus of texts in a given language. Then, what you do, just count the words that are occurring then, and make a list of these words together with the number of occurrences. Um, then, arrange these words in the order of diminishing uh, frequencies and uh, define the zip rank of a word as uh, its number in this ordering. And uh, 
an astonishing Zipf's law, an experimental statement, is that frequency of appearance of the word number i is proportional to a constant divided by i. So probability is inversely proportional to the rank. Uh, here is the picture in logarithmic scale. So if, if uh, the product of two things, frequency and rank, is approximately constant, then logarith the sum of logarithms is, uh, should, should lie on a line. And this is the empirical uh, check of Zipf's law. Uh, on, uh, in the distribution of Russian words. Here you see it. Of course, at the end something happens, but in between it's pretty exact. Okay. Uh, what is uh, astonishing again is that uh, Zipf's law is very universal. Uh, people consider various things, like, uh, for example, uh, you consider very different databases at the computers, of course, one could do that. Then uh, imagine uh, that you look and see, aha, uh -huh, there are certain patterns. <coughs> and uh, so to speak, words in a certain massive of data. You will see in, an example in the next page. Uh, you will have patterns in financial audit data. Uh, you will see that the same Zipf's law seems to be working there, and I quote Torrance Tau, unlike the central limit theorem, this law is primarily an empirical law. It is observed in practice, but mathematicians still do not have a fully satisfactory and convincing explanation for how the law comes about and why it is so universal. In order to understand what Tau means when he says universal, uh, just remember the uh, Gauss uh, law of distribution, proportionality of A, A uh, exponential of minus Bx squared, where x some natural variable. And uh, its universality <coughs> was explained by the so called central limit theory. Uh, theory. Uh, the idea is that um, imagine that you have some more or less stable thing but uh, it lives in the condition of uh, weak noise. So it's a little bit, uh, its stability is all the time, uh, <coughs> is uh, obtused by, by small uh, reactions. Now, if uh, you have a random variable which has more or less absolutely arbitrary statistical distribution. But uh, there are many, many such random variables that act upon it, like a uh, molecule uh, uh, pushing a small particle, various molecules, small particles in various <coughs> situations. And then the sum will tend, the distribution of the sum will tend to go some goes from whatever you start. This is, of course, kind of explains or makes it very probable, the, this uh, law. Uh, okay, so that will be the question mark, to which I will address a part of uh, my talk. And here is an additional empirical material, uh, which is similar to the Zips distribution of words. Uh, this is the first <coughs> page of a paper published in 2008, uh, where it was suggested uh, the following mathematical scheme uh, of checking big massive of actual data, uh, which is of course pretty difficult. So big firms <coughs> and big banks have such a lot of financial data that they are it's very difficult. And the idea was that we take an operational uh, database, then uh, you decide what kind of patterns you are looking, and then you uh, calculate the actual frequency distribution and compare it with Zips frequency distribution. And if it does not obey the Zips law, then very probably 
this data are fake. <coughs> Quite interesting and non trivial. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, skipping temporarily this, uh, I will <coughs> present you a totally different uh, reality in the world of ideas. Uh, it is a simple mathematical law that was discovered uh, probably about 30 years ago. Uh, I will explain briefly what is an error correcting code. Uh, you choose a certain alphabet, it's a finite set, so you may just imagine that uh, just something like alphabet of any of language uh, that uh, has a way to write its words. Uh, find a uh, set of cardinality Q. Uh, then consider all the words of length M. <coughs> what I will be explaining was Q and M can be chosen. They are variable, but then to define a code, they are fixed. So they are chosen and fixed. Okay, so a word is just a, a sequence of letters of the length N. And then the distance, Hemming's distance, uh, it's just the number of uh, points where uh, the letters of two words, the distance between two words, where the letters at this point are different. Um, and then you <coughs> construct code parameters. Basically, uh, you consider D, which is the minimal, it's a minimal distance between two different words in the code. And you divide it by the length of the code, and this will be the parameter delta, relative distance. And another is just consider how many uh, points uh, can have a code, uh, essentially logarithm cube, but you consider only the integer part of it for simplicity. And it's much better to consider this one. And again, divide by the, by the length. It's called transparent. And now, um, now, so I will say that uh, code with such parameters is an NKDQ code. And, and now, uh, here is the uh, physical reality or informational reality situation where uh, codes are used. Uh, they are used mostly in engineering problems, so to speak. And here I would like to state uh, my distinction between uh, engineering problems and scientific problems. Uh, when there is a certain environment, physical or ideal, uh, where you want to act efficiently, you devise what do you mean efficiently, what do you mean to act, but basically whatever is theory about it, you forget about it and just want to be efficient. Then it is engineering. If you want to understand all possible, uh, uh, your possible actions in changing situations and to see the limits of efficiency, for example, here I will be speaking further on, on the limits of efficiency, then of course you do some mathematical model. And here is a mathematical model of the following situation where in fact you do have, do want to, uh, to solve an engineering, engineering problem. So you're imagining that there is a certain source data. It can be something very simple, for example, uh, on an isolated island, uh, there is a uh, station, automatical station, that uh, observes the uh, temperature and speed of wind and things like that. Uh, and then translate is just, just by radio waves translated to a certain sector. So you have the source data. Uh, then, of course, you want to encode this sort of data. So there is a number of numbers, a sequence of numbers. But then your channel, the radio waves, is noisy. When uh, on the other end of this channel, channel somebody receives it, it is also a sequence of code words, but they might be corrupt, corrupt. So at this other end, uh, the error correction procedure is engineered. Uh, 
uh, that produces out of sequence of possibly corrupted code words, ideally sequence of initial code words. And then decoding, so you get the transmitted source data. So this is the engineering problem. Now I am uh, producing a mathematical scheme of it, but before that, here are classical examples. Um, this is the famous uh, Morse code. Uh, this is the dates, and alphabet there consists of three points, dash, dot, and space. And uh, uh, block length is maximal n equals to 7. Not all the words actually have the same length 7, but you can imagine empty spaces or add to the alphabet some special sign, empty sign, and just add to 7 everything. And here is uh, the usual alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, and so on. And here is how it was translated into Morse codes. And you know, of course, that Morse codes was used in the beginning of the century for some time uh, to translate a lot of data that were first encoded in human words and then in Morse and then decoded. And a more modern example, which is a descendant of Morse code, uh, is this ISBN, which you have seen everywhere, of course, on books and things like that. And uh, it was invented by Norman Woodland. Uh, and uh, uh, in some text about him, it's written that his inspiration came from Morse code. And he formed his first barcode from Sand on the Beach, and his quotation from him. I just extended the dots and dashes downwards and made uh, narrow lines and wide lines out of them. And uh, you see he fixed the lens. Okay, so these are examples of codes. And now we return to mathematics. Everything can be, mm, can be, uh, you, know, you have an infinite, infinite universe of possibilities for codes. For each such code C, you have two rational numbers that they can define. So minimal, how do you choose when you are doing engineering? How do you choose minimum relative distance? Well, you must match noisiness. This channel very noisy. Your code words should be very rare distributed. Uh, and uh, so probability of corruption of just one letter should be somehow matched. And then transmission rate then is the share of meaningful code words. Because uh, the less code words you have, the more of them you should use to transmit the initial uh, uh, source. And therefore, the transmission will be slow and slow. So ideally, you would like to somehow maximize both delta and R simultaneously. And uh, I, as not an engineer, but as a mathematician, would like to understand what are limits of this engineering problem. Uh, so here I'm introducing, it's not a term, and of course it's just, just, just uh, uh, a word, uh, metaphorical word. So good code must maximize both this and this. When the transmission rate is chosen, it must maximize minimal relative distance. But there is one more property. At the both ends of the channel, they must mean efficient algorithms of encoding, decoding, and error correction. And if you, your alphabet is unstructured, then of course you should just give lists and bits and compare lists. This is not a very effective way. So often it happens that uh, people are considering the so-called structure, structure, structural, structured codes. So, for example, for any Q which is a prime degree of a prime number, there exists a field consisting of FQ elements. You can sum, multiply elements, and things like that. And then linear codes uh, are chosen to be linear subspaces, not just subsets, but linear subspaces of such finite dimensional, finite dimensional and finite spaces. But there are also other rules too. Okay, now um, imagine the following picture. Uh, consider 
two uh, axes, delta and r. And uh, for each mkdq code c, now q will be fixed for this picture, but mk and d will be changed. Uh, just consider the, the respective point of the code, code point. Well, how it might look? It turns out that it might look in a very <coughs> funny way. Namely, there is a certain continuous curve uh, under which the code points are everywhere dense. And each code point there is above is isolated in a certain small, sufficiently small circle around it, there are no more code points. So I proved uh, this theorem, don't remember, 30, 30, two years ago. And since then, a lot of uh, articles were dedicated to the questions, can we calculate this continuous curve? And it turns out that up to now, we do not even know whether it is in principle computable. We don't know except for the very ends, where everything is very simple. We don't know if a single value, uh, if you consider this curve uh, as a graph of a function, you don't know a single value, exact value of uh, this function at a single point. This was very strange. Uh, also, uh, when I, after 30 years, returned to this problem, I uh, recalled that uh, there is a physical object that is somehow similar to this story. Namely, there are various pictures that uh, involve a phase transition, phase transition curves. For example, if, if you have a <coughs> gas, then you uh, start um, uh, pushing it together in smaller and smaller volume, then at a certain point, depending on the temperature, uh, it can become liquid. So it's a typical uh, transition between phases of gases and liquid. Okay, so uh, my uh, projection was, my uh, uh, idea was that can we uh, understand a mathematical picture where code transition uh, where uh, phase transition somehow plays a critical role. Uh, but have trans phase transitions in physics, we must have uh, analogous of physical notions of energy and temperature and pressure, of course, things like that. So it will be again physical notion in the ideal world. And uh, uh, now I will pass to the more mathematical picture, uh, uh, mathematical uh, explanations uh, in, uh, in my talk. Namely, I will be arguing that in this world, world of ideals, there exists a natural notion of energy. And this natural notion of energy is the so-called Kolmogorov complexity. So temporarily, you just forget about uh, about the um, about the concrete situations where I am now, and uh, imagine some combinatorial things like just integer numbers: one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, or uh, all uh, texts written on a given using a given code. So arbitrary sequences of words in given code and things like that. Kamagorov complexity intuitively uh, uses the following idea. Uh, some of the uh, sequences can be very tightly compressed. For example, initially uh, a natural number is just a sequence of bars say, uh, so if you want to say 10,000, then you just should draw 10,000 bars. You just count things. But we know now, of course, that uh, you can compress it very much. Choose a uh, uh, dyadic or, or decimal system of notation. And then, instead of 10,000 bars, you need only about logarithm of this 10,000. Uh, 
So they can be very much compressed. And this compression is, so to speak, universal. We are all using decimal systems without thinking much about it. But even with decimal systems, some of the numbers can be compressed much more than the others. For example, if you write 10 power 10, then uh, to write completely, you said write uh, 1 and then uh, 10 zeros. But 10 power 10 is much shorter. What about 10 power 10 power 10? Reverse, even reverse. It's, it's compressed again, and will you be compressed? It's very, very short. But uh, 1 and then the number of zeros is very big. And things like that. So Kolmogorov invented or understood uh, using basically the idea of Turing, a universal Turing machine, he understood that there is a mathematical notion of maximal uh, compression. And I will return back to some, <coughs> to some properties of this mathematical notion because they are not at all uh, they are not at all intuitive, in a way they are even counterintuitive. So here are a few words about Kolmogorov complexity. So we can consider uh, combinatorial objects like words in a given alphabet, in particular just numbers, combinatorial object, and then each such work has what I will call logarithmic Kolmogorov complexity. So logarithmic Kolmogorov complexity of an integer number is no more than a constant multiplied by logarithm of this number. Then there is also a version of exponential Kolmogorov complexity. I will not speak about it. Uh, I will just exponentiate the logarithmic one. And also it can be can refer not to combinatorial objects but to computable functions. Because after all uh, each computable function can be given by a lot of programs for computation. We just take the, the, the shortest problem, something like that. And uh, so the intuitive description is logarithmic Kolmogorov complexity of logica is defined as the length of the shortest program that can generate one. Again. Now there is a lot of indeterminacy, of course. The main one is that um, that, okay, you can uh, describe omega in different uh, program, uh, program, program languages, of course. And then the, the size somewhat changes. It turns out that it changes not much. If you consider complexities of all the whole infinite data of combinatorial objects and then change the method of programming, their logarithmic uh, complexities will just say by change by a um, uh, restricted uh, value. So here is a representative example. So combinatorial object is omega. It's represented by n written dashes or logarithm of n, uh, say, uh, letters in uh, uh, decimal of alphabet. Oh, sorry, not decimal. And uh, it's exponential complexity, therefore, something like that. And uh, just imagine that you are trying <coughs> to see the graph of the logarithm complexity uh, of natural. Well, it will be most of the time close to the logarithm of it, most of the time. And it was long ago suggested that those numbers that are incompressible Incompressible. Their digits, for example, are uh, random, and there is a lot of mathematical theorem saying that the physical notion of random, randomness is realized in this way. But uh, I will be interested not in not so much in them as in those numbers or those combinatorial objects whose uh, logarithm complexity falls below. It turns out that this happened infinitely often, and it can fall very, very low below, uh, below this curve. If you put here any graph of any computable function which grows, 
somewhere the complexity will fall lower than this computable function. That's very interesting. Another uh, property of uh, <coughs> word complexity that, that for which engineers don't like it is that it is itself an uncomputable. <laughs> it is not a function that you can calculate. Uh, upper approximation, okay, but not the function itself. Nevertheless, uh, my suggestion here is will that this will not be complex, but it's just the necessary notion of energy in the world of ideas that will explain two things. The floor and will throw some light onto this mysterious curve in the theory of fluids. Uh, moreover, this Kolmogorov uh, complexity has a property which is so strange and counterintuitive that I have never seen it explicitly uh, stated in this way in the literature. It is very much fractal, it has a lot of fractal properties. One is this, that uh, okay, here you just have all uh, uh, natural numbers in the order of their growth. Uh, <coughs> consider only a subset uh, consisting of values of more or less arbitrary computable function and restrict this graph onto this subset. Forget about all other numbers, integers, and look at the new uh, complexity. Uh, the respective graph will be exactly the same as here up to additive restricted thing. So you, you change scale very much, you get the same thing. Another property, uh, consider again all these numbers and consider arbitrary permutation of all integers, again, such that this permutation is computable and reverse is computable. You will again get the same graph. So it's fantastically stable picture, as I said, counterintuitive, and whenever computer scientists hear about it, they are usually also uh, somewhat astonished because, as I said, the uh, attitude of engineering does not allow them to think about these ways that uh, are um, somehow outside of uh, the uh, freedom <coughs> of engineering, engineering computing, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, so when I said that I will be uh, that I will be drawing more attention to those numbers or combinatorial objects or whatever that have very simple complexity, very small complexity, then uh, we can just uh, arrange a different order. Uh, a different order, just take the, all your objects, imaginary objects, and arrange them in the order of growing complexity and not in the order of growing volume of text that is needed to describe them in a usual way just in the order of growing complexity. Uh, and uh, mm, here is a, a statement about existence of optimal number of number or decompression. I will skip it. Uh, I want only to, uh, to stress that number of complexity, uh, besides being not computable, it cardinally differs from the natural order in the following sense. Since it puts in the initial segment very large numbers that can be at the same time a number of simple, and here is an example that I mentioned briefly. n power, n power, n, n times. So complexity is the same as complexity of it. <coughs> and my central argument in this talk is that uh, there are natural, observable, and measurable phenomena in the world of information that can be given a mathematical explanation if one postulates that logarithmic Kolmogorov of complexity plays a role of energy. So uh, I will explain Zipf's law and uh, how now Zipf's law can be seen from this viewpoint. Uh, 
my first postulate is that rank ordering in the zips order coincides or closely resembles the ordering with respect to growing exponential Kolmogorov complexity. This means a certain postulate probably about the way our brains works when it produces the uh, uh, words, the sentence, meaningful sentences and things like that. Uh, for some time we couldn't say anything about it, but now there are some interesting new ideas. And then uh, the probability distribution uh, producing the floor is an approximation to the uh, Leonid Levin's a priori distribution that was discovered actually in the 60s, but it again in this context uh, was left somehow unnoticed. And uh, if we postulate these two things, uh, then uh, we can mathematically deduce that uh, probability is approximately inversely proportional to the rank. Okay, there is some not real mathematics in all of it. I forget it. But the picture that I described agrees, agrees with the Ziggs himself motto that his law is produced by minimization of effort. He didn't say exactly what is the effort and how it should be measured in order to minimize it. But I am saying F4 is complexity, is the length of compression, and uh, it's uh, uh, minimized in this way. And as I said, such a picture make, makes sense, especially if the objects satisfying this distribution are generated rather than simply observed. It's they are generated, they are in the world of ideas and not in the physical world. Okay. Uh, now, uh, we return to codes, uh, and uh, now, how can we uh, explain uh, the existence of this curve using Kolmogorov complexity? Uh, basically, uh, in 2011, I proved that uh, codes of infinite multiplicity uh, is, uh, are exactly those rational points, uh, sorry, uh, code points under the curve are exactly those code points that are produced by infinitely many codes, whereas those that are in the upper part are produced by only finite. And this curve, which is called asymptotic bound, and then with our uh, in our paper with Matilda Marpoli, uh, we said that uh, we proved that if an oracle produces for us elements of codes in their Kolmogorov order and not in their naive order, growing volume and things like that, then we can write an oracle assisted algorithm that enumerates code points essentially under the code. And uh, here is the partition function, the physical partition function that uh, produces uh, the mathematical uh, arrangement where one can speak about phase transition. And uh, without giving precise details, I just say that in this mathematical arrangement, transmission rate corresponds to the density of uh, the usual physical systems. And density, of course, clear. It's how dense are code points among all, uh, code words among all words or fixed lengths. And uh, uh, if we change, uh, if we call by temperature the horizontal uh, coordinate in the picture, if we define it as a inverse temperature, then uh, this curve becomes a phase transition boundary in the plane of temperature and density. Very, very traditional, very, very well-known physical phenomenon. Um, yeah, I guess that's just a good time to stop.